Hello, everyone. Welcome. The time has come for the Haitian Women's Alliance to interview the legendary Miss Stella Jean, Italian, Haitian, fashion designer. And Stella, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So it's a big Absolutely. honor and a great pleasure. Yes. And, you know, you are so relevant right now. You are just on fire. You're on fire. I want to tell you that. But you know that already. <laughs> we are working. We are working. And we still have a lot of work to do. So we keep working. Yes. And as we wait for people to join the feed, I'm sure they are wondering exactly who Stella Jean is. But I think most people already know you are a very talented fashion designer. In fact, you are fresh off the runways of Milan Fashion Week. How is that? Uh, yeah, it's been a really uh, uncommon fashion week. Coming from so many point of view, it, it has been virtual. And then uh, for the first time, we reached this big goal for us to have, for the first time in the Italian Fashion Week, five POC designer in the official uh, Milan Fashion Week schedule. Oh, wow. And we will talk much more in depth about that. But I also want to mention that you just had a feature in Vogue magazine. Yeah, Vogue magazine, Vogue USA have been really, really supportive. One of the most important magazines in, uh, in this last month, which have been pretty difficult. We've been through some struggles, but I can say that uh, actually Vogue US has been one of the most supportive um, outlet so they really help us and they really uh, amplify our voices yes and I know you're probably in vogue about every other month or so so I know this is probably not much of a big deal for you but I want to tell you that the Haitian community is so so proud of you you are the pride of Haiti I hope you know that no I have to do more I, there's a, as I said there was, there's much more to do so I have to do more Yes. And you know, well, I appreciate you saying that. That is very ambitious of you and very kind hearted. But I want to put up on the screen um, one of the fashions of your latest collection that was just featured in Vogue magazine. The, the image may cover us a little bit, but hopefully the viewers will forgive that. And there it is. It is absolutely amazing. Is this is a, mean, nice, a nice painting. So you can see 80 almost in <laughs> each one of my collection. It's a really yeah. huge part of my work and Absolutely. my inspiration. Yes. And, you know, I was doing a little Googling on you before we sat down for this interview, and I found this picture of you that I simply adore. <laughs> I mean, you are just a Haitian princess in this photo, and that skirt looks like it's just taken um, just from the outdoor environment of, of any Haitian village. What was the inspiration for that? A naive painting so it's a typical it's a typical asian village and uh, that this skirt have been sold out i don't even have my own anymore really because <laughs> i was going to ask you about getting one <laughs> <laughs> find one for me too it would be a because right I, will. I will let you know and as i mentioned you're you're so relevant right now because of your efforts and your work and the attention that you have been bringing to Black Lives Matter. And I know that there has been a resurgence of that particular issue here in the States and actually globally because of what happened with George Floyd. And that happened here on U.S. soil, but yet you felt a need to make your voice heard. Why is that? You know, actually, I'm the first Black designer member of the Italian Fashion Council since its foundation in 1958. So at the moment, I'm still the only one. So mm. you can easily understand how unreal is this uh, situation. I mean, I'm, a, I'm not, an even, I'm not even a number, I'm an exception. So in July, mm -hmm. during the most recent fashion week, I said I would not return to Milan Fashion Week until I was the only black designer there. My decision has absolutely nothing to do with boycotting. It's, it was a request for attention to be paid to a whole generation of invisible people who in uh, this country have taken to the square from the north to the south in support of Black Lives Matter. 
my uniqueness in Italy is truly incomprehensible in a field like fashion that prides itself on celebrating progressiveness, creativity, and freedom of, of expression. So despite the establishment of the so-called uh, Russia sensitivity training, uh, which also sounds so incredible, so someone have to teach you how to be kind with other ethnicities. So mm -hmm. uh, there are certain sensitivities and decision-making skills that cannot be learned in a workshop alone. And as we Italians enjoy an internationally recognized position as trendsetter in the fashion industry, we should also never forget that power and responsibility are two ways to describe the same thing. So the influence of Italian fashion has direct cultural and social implication for billions of people on global scale. And made in Italy should not only be a guarantee of fashion excellency, but also a commitment to promote human excellency. So the new multicultural Italy is not racist. It cannot be racist. So we have a multicultural country now. So and we really wish to stop seeming so in the eyes of the world. Too often, errors and sensitivity blackouts by a few companies or individuals become an accurate and unwanted stigma for an entire nation. Mm, yes, and you have taken up this charge. You said that many times you would show up and be the only black fashion designer. So I have to ask you the question, have you experienced racism in your career as a fashion designer? Oh, lately, yes. Over the last year, since I've started questioning Italian fashion, asking for equal opportunities, I've received a great deal of pressure and acts of intimidation in the force to force me to end this demand for civil rights. People who support me as well as the Black Lives with the, this move, we call this movement Black Lives Matter in Italian fashion, BLMIF, were close to me and have, uh, they have undergone a great deal of pressure and coercion to stop this fight as well. They were made promises to, of assistance and professional help, along with featured in one of the most important Italian fashion magazines, proposed, proposed in exchange of, for silence. So mm -hmm. the setting is that it's an Italian white female editor who shows complete dedication to the causes of diversity and integration in her magazine, but she's behind some of worst acts of bullying and threatening meant to stop us and interrupt the real deal of attention that this subject has been receiving. So these attention were meant to keep this, this discussion exactly where it is, where it's been. So in the shadows and far from the public gaze. Mm. And I know you've been quoted as saying that this is not a protest, this is a proposal. What exactly did you mean by that? Uh, first, we have to understand that the racial issue in Italy is um, is almost a case study. It's really peculiar. That it has nothing to do with uh, our neighbor, European neighbor, nothing to do with the American one. And uh, we, must, we must not forget the irony of our history. When we Italians were the unwanted immigrants and we were referred to as black, as black whites, in the United States, now it, it, it wasn't so gentle. So I, I've just put some nice words. It, the words was were not so nice at all. Mm -hmm. So much like Black Italians who currently find it so difficult to find full recognition in their own country. So a part of the very same story is once again knocking now on, on our door, asking our memory to answer. So we, it's related to uh, to a really peculiar. Um, condition which belong to to Italy, and as Black Lives Matter in Italian fashion, we uh, we are here and we remain next to all of the Italian brands. So it's not a pro protest, as you say, it's a proposal. So we, we remain to, next to all of the Italian brands that live in the real world and want to tune with the real world out of the palaces of power, and are determined to not display multiculturalism as just as a fad or a form of performative propaganda crafted for media consumption, which is a rampant marketing technique that only adds insult to injury. So we have asked to Italian brands who have made the most significant cultural gaffe, gaffe recently. You obviously maybe I think that you know we which are these brands because we are they are um, among the most 
recognized uh, worldwide. So mm -hmm. we asked them to be the first, the first to join the Black Lives Matter Italian fashion think tank and to position both their names and their faces on the presentation of a new Italy, um, one which will use its global influence to support civil rights. So the largest one amongst the aforementioned will be able to show us with concrete facts and action that their greatness matches an equally grand sense of responsibility and human, humanity beginning at home. So leading by example, starting at home. We believe that cohesiveness and sincerity of the intent of many brands that have guaranteed and promised great sorry, change and have also promised to listen to official corporate announcement on their Instagram pages. Because if you go and check and scroll their pages on Black Cow Tuesday, you will see each Italian uh, huge brand Mm, they wrote down some great statement, great promises, great um, generous uh, quotes in solidarity of Black Lives Matter. The thing is, is that they never meant to uh, help or support Black Italians. Their, um, their generosity were all for Black Lives Matter, mostly in US, because for them it's more, much more mediatic. So it's like you are using um a problem you are using something it it, um, it, it was so inhuman so mm -hmm. we asked them to stop this kind of facade, facade. and yeah. we invited the made in italy brands that have found inspiration in black culture those who have made both visual tri triumphs and offenses to join us at this table this meeting uh, market and launch a point for a path of responsibility and concrete action on an international platform that Italy will forge in support of these issues through its adoption through the adoption of a six point cultural reform proposal which in which are education cultural appropriation uh, database that includes fashion professional from variety of variety of cultural backgrounds and skills who are available to Italian companies willing to increase diversity and value within their business, checks and balance, self-regulation, and insensitivity conversation. Mm. Well, Stella, I have to ask you, you put so much thought into this. It is so organized. Your proposal is so clear. But when I heard of this, I got scared because I know what it is to have a career that you're so invested in, that you love so much, and you experience racism or bias in something that you love, that you have such a passion for. But sometimes when we use our voice and we speak out against that injustice, there is a backlash. There are consequences. Were you at any point afraid that you speaking out would negatively affect your career? I can't say that. I, I think I just think that mm, you know, in fashion, your work is shown to the world. So the world decide. Now the public opinion will decide if they like it or not. Thanks to all, uh, also thanks to democratic tools as social media. No, so uh, it's not about really. It's not, it didn't affect my my um, my work. They've just tried to. Um, to scare me and try to stop me. This is the most, um, it's something that is unbelievable for me because I thought that this kind of intimidation belonged to uh, old, old fashion or old, an old country. It was the Italy of mafia, something that old for us, not- You were surprised. Absolutely surprised. I would, I would never think that someone from the fashion field, we are talking about the progressiveness, avant-garde, whatever you can say about fashion, like it's a field like art, you know, and you don't think that you will find someone who will try to stop in just because you try to break in the silence or you are, they are afraid that the, you are touching their, their powerful position. And they, it, it's incredible. I can't say that they really affect me. They just try to stop me. But what I, I wrote, that's, they, they forgot that I have an Asian mother. We never accept <laughs> any kind of chain and chain. And I'm not, I won't be the first one to break such a lovely tradition. Mm hmm. Yo pat kone. They did not right. know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Because we have secret weapon, and that secret weapon is Haiti. <laughs> well, yes, because 
even mm-hmm. it's exactly when they tried to stop me that I understood that it was time for me to move forward. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I want to celebrate your showing at Italian Fashion Week, and I would love to show this video of some of the stylists of color who presented there. It's in Italian though, so I would love for you to say a few words about it to tell the people what it's about before I play it. Um, I've asked the five, uh, we call them Fab Five because they've been resilient (laughs) and courageous enough to knock to every door for years, even to six to six or uh, 10 years and nobody had turned and nobody gave them an opportunity for the first time they were on the set of the shooting and of the video crying almost all the time because they were it was unbelievable for them and i think they really deserve deserve a chance now it's up to their talents no to see which will be their path i can do anything else or more but i really think that they really deserve a chance Yes, well, let's take a look. <laughs> Il Made in Italy non è un colore. Io non sono un colore. Io sono 200.000 anni di storia, non un trend. Una collezione è più della somma dei suoi capi. Gli abiti possono parlare in maniera più decisa e diretta di molte parole. L'incontro di culture è una scelta irreversibile. È il confronto con il diverso è già parte di noi. L'altro è ora già parte di noi. L'Italia è fatta di noi. Yes, I love that. I love that. I'm sorry that you didn't have the, um, the because we have the, the version with the English subtitle. Oh, so we okay. Hear, right, read what we, uh, mm-hmm. what we put there. We put that it, uh, made in Italy is not a color. Being Italian is not a color anymore and is not the color white. So it doesn't have to be just a privilege as it has always been. And as a cliche, no, about made in Italy, about Italians is everybody thinks that uh, it's correspond to, to a color and, and it's not anymore. And uh, what, as we said during the video, we are not a trend. We are 200,000 years of history. So we are um, we are here, and we mean that we are here to stay. I hear that we are here to stay, and I love to see that video because it's a slice of Italy that we don't normally see. All these faces of color, all these hues from from olive to to dark dark brown and black. It's amazing. You don't see that on the media, so I love to see it in that context and surrounded by all this beauty. This was also an answer of when we have to Italian brand, why you don't have um, diversity, why you don't have the black employee in your companies. One of their answer was, um, I, I, we don't know that, we didn't know that uh, there were Italian, black Italians no, in, uh, in this country. And uh, we said, it's, it's incredible, it's incredible. Maybe out of your country club or exclusive, um, place that you usually visit the in the real country there's a new it's a, there's a complete new generation of multicultural uh, italian with a multicultural background and every shade of color yes and you are leading that new generation and i think it's completely amazing and you have so many accolades in the fashion industry too many to even name and i know you are so so humble but Many celebrities everywhere around the globe are wearing your fashions. I mean, Beyonce cannot breathe without you. It's crazy. <laughs> and, and it's like, I just look at your work. There is one piece right there and you are your own model in that. I like, I need that skirt. 
<laughs> Some years ago in my life. <laughs> It's really quite amazing. And, and you know, we can see that your culture and even African culture you see represented there in your work. I mean, this seems like a very deliberate and bold choice. Why did you decide to go that route? I think that the need to put forward and uh, preserve the multiculturalism inherent in this work comes from the fact that I've always had to as you know, my mother comes from Italy and my father from Italy. I was born in Rome, but I've spent two years in Italy. And I was mortified that such a great country was known just for uh, some wrong reasons. Earthquake, extreme poverty, charity action. But uh, through my uh, missions in different low-income countries, I understood that after an immediate emergency cases, help should come in a totally different form also in order to build a long-term action, considering that this population have so many cultural resources, which would allow them to rise up again on their feet without the need of charity action. 80 first. What they need is someone who decides to believe in their capacity and give them the opportunity to work. Putting They've always worked, like we know Asian people, we are used to work, but putting in place their own skills this kind of initiative would also attract the new local generation to their ancestral artisan, artisanal skills in danger of extinction, extinction and ensure continuity. So when the new generation see through the media, through the cult work, the result and response on their traditional work gives them the uh, incentive to keep their traditions alive. This, is, this should be the power of fashion to me. This is, as, this is an acknowledgement of fashion's potential as a cultural activity to provide significant opportunities for decent work for men and women around the world. So it's another complete um, idea, vision of fashion to me is that is beyond aesthetic. It's, uh, it, if you consider it that fashion is such a powerful tool, we can't use just to make some beautiful clothes now. So I need to put a sense on it and the multiculturalism. And it's my, it's my um, mm -hmm. um, point of view and my attitude to fashion. So personally, uh, people can come first. So uh, I worry first to the surviving of endangered people and communities and then one step at a time I find sustainable and customized solution to be integrated in this process. We can't have all sustainable all at once overnight. It's, uh, it's incredible and I don't think it's something possible. Yes, and I know you have a very global approach to, to fashion and sustainability, but you are very modest, like I said, but you have actually gone back to Haiti to, to source materials, to invest in the economy, to bring others along with you. I want to show this, this picture that I found that is so powerful. Can you describe to us what's happening here? We were not far from uh, Noai. And um, this lady was showing me this kind of patchwork. We were, try we were trying to adapt all these different skills. This was, this was just one of the steps, but we have integrated the fer forger, papier mâché, in mm -hmm. a fashion collection with a kind of um, Western touch. So we, uh, we have integrated the collection that shows in Milan Fashion Week with all these um, typical Asian skill and also to prove people that uh, they could be also wearable and uh, fashionable. Mm, yes, and I think that is amazing that you went back to the place of your mother's birth to, to give back. And you are biracial. You are half Italian, half Haitian. Please tell us your Haitian background and and where it all started. Uh, <laughs> I, had, <laughs> I have a, a really special Haitian mother and I think I owe her a lot, even if she have always been and she's still a very strict mother. So, uh, she forced us to study Asian history and uh, she bring 
uh, books from AD and uh, friends to enforce hard to study. And the, something that I remember that she teach me that uh, it really impressed me at the time because I was so skeptical. You have to think that we didn't have um, internet. So when she, uh, when we passed our studying Asian story, and then she would keep saying, uh, it is the first black republic in the world, the, the most fur, the first one, the, the biggest one, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and with all our pride. And I was uh, at a certain moment, I say, listen, you are telling me all this thing, but we don't read this history on my school books. Why? If it's true, if it's such an important country, such an important piece of history, why is not on my history books or my uh, my history books of the French school or the Italian school? And then she answered me, um, don't ask the lion the story of how the mouse escaped him. So it, has, it remains for me one big... Um, uh, it's something that remains in my mind always. Yeah. It's true. It's true. The, the story has been wrote by the winners. So we just read and we just learn a part of the history. And uh, AD is one of, uh, of it's, it's one example because it's true in our school books, we, they never put AD. Mm, yes. And you took it upon yourself to highlight our Haitian culture. Because, yeah, because it's, it's so here. great, it's so uh, it's so fascinating, and you know, I think that everybody can experience. It's not because I'm of Asia. If you go to Haiti and you see, and people see the quantity of problem and this is that we have, and despite of everything, this is one of the most fascinating places in the world. It it um, really have something mystic magical, whatever you want to say, art, history, everything is there. And such a deep and great culture that you will hardly find in other countries of, uh, of Central and South America. So when you keep saying, or when I keep hearing that they know Haiti just for the, when I say Haiti, they just answer, ah, the earthquake and the extreme poverty, I say, no, no, it's much more than, uh, than, than this. So. It's something that I that I try I've always try to do is to show the beauty, the great beauty of this country. We need to show the beauty because we have we need people to be attracted. We need people to go there to to do something in the country, do something with the country. Because if they keep uh, being scared, scared of keep um, of they keep distances with aid, just sending some money with. Uh, with this charity action that I personally don't appreciate, because if, if this country showed something to the world, is that is able to to not stay on his knee. So we have we own all the, and I say we when I say that. Do you, do you hear? Yes. <laughs> we know how to to get up, and I I'm sure that AD will do it again. He have to. Absolutely. Absolutely. We will. We have to. We always do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We teach the world. We've been the first one. So so when I see just um, people trying to help with charity instead of work, instead of opportunity, instead of, of a dialogue, you know, we, it's like we don't even deserve to be um, uh, um, an, interloc an, an interlocutor. It's... It, in, I, I, I can't, I can't, uh, <laughs> no, I know exactly what you it. mean. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. And you know, I, I meant to, to compliment you because your English is amazing when you consider that, you know, you're born and raised in Italy. So you speak Italian, you speak French, you speak Creole, you speak English, who knows what else. You're just an international woman of the world. Kudos to you, but you are doing amazing. Thank you. I'm so shy <laughs> of my English, but anyway. <laughs> no, you're great. And you know, the, the Haitian community is watching right now and they have some questions for you. And they're they're kind of very serious questions. They they I mean they are the journalists. I thought I was the journalist with my heart, <laughs> but here you go. It says, Does Miss Jean have an apprentice program for young designers in the Caribbean? Not really, but uh, some people organize a uh, kind of apprentices program there, like um, 
Michel Chatain or uh, other. So maybe we can put them in contact with uh, with them. And mm. Even UNESCO, even UNESCO is doing a great program. So I have a friend of me with, with she's there. She's in Haiti right now, and she's working on it. Mm, yes, but that is a very good resource. So thank you for mentioning that. So hopefully Street Team Productions is taking note. <laughs> There's a good career and networking step for you. Okay, here's another one. I knew this one was coming. I knew it. Was <laughs> Where can we get your clothes in the US? What is the website? Give us the link. We need to know. <laughs> you should please, Marvel Celestin, send an email to the info at stellagent.it and then say which is your state, and then they will um, send you the addresses for the US. Oh, okay. Do you have any plans to, um, can we see you in any major luxury department stores anytime soon? Why not? We've been in sex, we've been in the <laughs> Marcus, we've been, uh, so why not? She's like, well, we've been everywhere already, Marley. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let us, let's see what else people are saying. Oh, somebody wants to know. Hmm. Do you have any plans to expand to the US and open any of your own locations? Why not? Maybe to, now is not really the right moment to open <laughs> new businesses, but we've tried to keep the what we have because it's a really tough time. And I think that you that you understand too, no, because I don't think that in the US you are living uh you are suffering of the consequences of the COVID as well as we are experiencing in Italy and in Europe. So now we are trying to keep our business alive, but mm -hmm. absolutely, we, I would like to, even because the U.S. is the country which responds better to our work, to our collection, is the most curious, is the most supportive, and so absolutely. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I have, you know, I, I would like to add something about the U.S., when yes. we start to have problem, when we start this fight some months ago, the first who uh, send their support have been a uh, designer. And and I know that in US you have full of uh, diaspora designer. Uh, they they yeah. immediately say, we are next to you. We support you. Don't, you're not alone. You're not alone. So uh, they gave me a great, great support. Victor Glemont. And, uh, and many others that are part of the Asian diaspora in, uh, in the US. Mm, yes. Okay, the questions are just rolling in. Who were your her. role model? <laughs> <laughs> I can say, I think that she would be uh, proud, but uh, I, I have to say my, uh, my mother, even if is not of one of the most uh, lovely person in earth, but she's, she's, she teach me how to be so strong and reactive. So I think she's a, she's a role model. Mm, yes, absolutely. But who are your role models in fashion? I don't really have role model in fashion. I have no, I, I really a um, particular role model. One was uh, the Nobel Prize Rigoberta Menchu from Guatemala, or I have an Asian role model, which is uh, Marise Benet Kedar. Um, I love this strong women. I love this. Um, it's, it's not something related to their aesthetic. It's something related to their uh, soul. So um, if you know Marie Spenet, she's one of my, of my role models. Mm -hmm. Another great Asian, another great Asian woman. I really, I really love her. So yes, I would like yeah. to. Yes, great like Haitian her. women. That is what we're celebrating here. Um, and we have a comment from a, a great Haitian woman. Hey, Gertie, thanks for watching. Um, she said that you gave great advice for new designers and that was exactly one of the questions that I had on my list. What would, advice would you give to young designers of color all over the world who aspire to do what you do, be on the top runways all over the world on, in Vogue magazine and Saks Fifth Avenue? How do you do it? Give us the secret. Don't be afraid. Don't be mm. afraid like, because someone will try to break you and mortify for you for sure. Don't be afraid. Don't let people 
don't let people stop you don't let people tell you who you are absolutely not so just remember who you are even when you um, mostly when you have roots strong like uh, asian uh, asian roots and just remember that you owe something to those who have been there before you that allowed you to be here today and you owe something to the one that will come after you so it's a great sense of responsibility that should be also, that should also inspire i think the the new designer in this historical moment maybe in the past they were lucky enough to just do fashion designer glamorous <laughs> words sparkly words not now in this historical moment we have a great responsibility so sometimes you won't have any other option than uh, do what it you have to do in this moment it's something that also my mother used to tell me and she always gave me this gave me this great sense of responsibility she always told me um go where you want and uh, stay where you have to so mm -hmm. will and responsibility always yeah together. can you say that in french for us because i think it sounds beautiful in french <laughs> yes I need a t-shirt. <laughs> that is wonderful. In, in this new collection, right in this new collection, I, I, I realized a t-shirt. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> I'll try to send to you. Oh, thank you. That's amazing. Okay. So we have more questions from Janice Lawrence Clark. Do you consider yourself a Caribbean designer? A good question, since we already said you're Italian, Haitian, Caribbean, does that play into it too? I'm, uh, I have both the, the cultures, so I can, I can consider myself Italian, Caribbean, or Italian. I prefer to say Italian, Asian, which is more specific. So if I say Asian, you will understand better my work and my collection when you see it. So I prefer, I prefer to see, I have to be more specific and say Italian, Asian designer. Mm, yeah, so you rather be more specific as yeah. opposed to broad. Okay. All right, Janice, you got your answer. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's like there are so many people who are so interested in what you're saying and so many comments and questions. Somebody said, I need a t-shirt too. I have a feeling a lot of people are going to be asking you after today. <laughs> <laughs> so watch out for that. Um, so many people, and I also want to give a shout out to the Haitian Women's Alliance. So many of our members are currently watching, Gertie, Genevieve, Rita, Pat, of course, is watching. It's hi, like, Pat. Yes, hi, Pat, um, who is actually Pat Bouvet, um, who is your friend, who is leading the charge here at the Haitian Women's Alliance, and she's been such a great and fearless leader, and, um, and she connected us for this interview, so thanks, Pat. And it's even if she's keep wonderfully. saying uh, hi, Pat. Even if you keep saying Jean instead of Jean, and then uh, oh no, because we know each other for so many years, and then a nation <laughs> say Jean, and you know that Jean in one in one of it's one of the most common Asian family names, so you can't get wrong with Jean. <laughs> That's right. You see that Pat? She called you out. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> But next time we'll have to get Pat on so we can tell her in person. <laughs> oh, here's another question. What are some of your practices that have made you such a success? I love that. Practices. Uh, I, I don't know if I can say some practices. Maybe I think that my education helped me a lot and my faith also. So there are some elements that guide me and help me because you need something to help you in the difficult moment that will be um you will have we will have more difficult moment than easy ones so you need some uh, great uh, um answer to them for me it's my education and my religion mm, your education and your religion that is just the foundation of life <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, here's another question. What do the other black designers in Italy say or feel about the movement for diversity? 
Ah, uh, they are so happy. I have to, I have to thank another designer, which is uh, Edward Bucana, which is actually an American designer who's there since 20 years, 25 years old in, uh, in Italy. And uh, Misha Gonmo, another, uh, the organizer of Afro Fashion Week in Italy. So we've been, so we, we've worked together and it's thanks to their support that we have this first result we had and we obtained the first um, unit uh, in, in the Italian Fashion Council, which is a Black Lives Matter in Italian Fashion Working Group. So great, great result in this, uh, this month. So some struggle and then some great result. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And I would imagine that you are such an inspiration and a role model for all the designers of color in Italy, because I would imagine um, the community is quite small there in Italy and everyone knows each other. So I'm sure they look to you. Thank you. <laughs> well, we have have such amazing comments. I have to share them with you from Genevieve. Love you guys. Awesome and inspirational conversation. Um, this one, which you'll be getting like a million of. Rita needs a t-shirt. <laughs> uh, let's see. From Janice, kudos to you, Stella Jean, for seeking out your truth. I love that one. Let me Thank see. you, Janice. <laughs> Let me see what else we got here. There are just so many. Mm, let's see. How did this all start? Well, we covered that already. <laughs> so, so we know by now. Let's see, what else do we have here? I think we've covered everything, Stella. Before you go, I would like to ask you, is there anything that you would like to say, that you would like to touch on, that you want to put out in the world? Ah, uh, I have a long list. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that about the, what happening right now in Italy, that uh, I would just ask to our major band that, if they keep even half of the promises they made, it will be a revolution. So even half of their promises, it's enough. Otherwise, it's an hypocrite and unacceptable attitude toward uh, an issue which, which means something too sad to be used just as a marketing, as a, as a strategy. And to be more light in the other in the other side, uh, what I can I would like to even not not now because we have this COVID problem, but once it will be over, more people that come in Italy from eighty. So uh, I would <laughs> like to to meet some more Asian in uh, in Italy. So if you ever after the COVID plan to come. We will welcome you because uh, we, need, we need more Asian in Italy. We need more food, Asian food. So bring something with you. It's something that I always do when I when I travel. I travel with my John John and other things that. You oh wow, with. that's amazing! <laughs> Actually, that reminds me of a question I was going to ask you. What's your favorite Asian food? Ri John John. Um, even some sweetness like Duslet, Dus, uh, Dus Marcos, Coco Yerate, mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything. Amazing. We so, don't have Asian restaurant. We don't have Asian food. So it's something that I really, really miss. It's yeah. Part so our, it's part of our culture. So. Yes, a very strong part of our culture. And yes, I would imagine it's hard to find in Italy. So you have to keep very close to those roots. You, know, you have to have your Tuli John Joe in your little bowl in your purse. I understand. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stella Jean, for joining us. You see, now I'm messing up the name. <laughs> you are an inspiration. I have to put up your picture one more time. Look at this beautiful Haitian woman. My goodness, I am going to celebrate you to, to the end because you are worthy of celebration. I thank you for your talent, um, for your willingness to give back, not just to Haiti, but to all people of color to advance them in fashion and in anything they decide, decide to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marley. Thank you for, for your energy. I really appreciate it. So. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for this great initiative at Asian Women's Alliance. Absolutely. Be well. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Ciao.